Mayor Adrian Sandoval. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Larry Clark. Here. Harold Leggett. Present. Nick Ralston. Here. Spencer Bradman. Here. Troy Blum. Hope Morris. Here. All right. Can I get an approval for the agenda? I make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Moving on to audience participation. First, we have um, Energy Performance Contracting Program by Apollo. Tara Fowler. That's correct. Welcome. Yes. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. So, um, my name is Tara Fowler. I'm an account manager for Apollo Solutions Group at based out of Denver. And so last month, I actually met with Troy and David and talked a little bit about what my company does and ways that we've helped towns reduce their energy consumption um, and their utility costs and just upgrade their whole infrastructure. And so after I met with Troy and David, they suggested that I come to the council meeting today and kind of ex present the IZM program to you all and talk about next steps if we want to proceed to move forward. So. So a little bit about Apollo Solutions Group. So we are a division of Apollo Mechanical. And so our mechanical contracting wing has been in business for almost 40 years now. Um, the Solutions Group, our energy services side, has only been around since basically 10 years now, since 2008. And we just started breaking into the Colorado market about two or three years ago. And so um, we are based out of north, in the northwest, out of Spokane, Washington, actually. My division's out of Spokane, but our mechanical division's out of Kennewick, which is southern Washington. And so um, we've had quite a bit of success out in the Pacific Northwest with our energy services program. And now we're just trying to spearhead that and come out um, to Colorado. And we actually are an approved energy services company through the state of Colorado. So for municipalities that want to do an energy performance contracting project, you actually have to go through the state and go through an approved ESCO, which Apollo is. And so just to explain the ESCO concept, if you guys aren't truly familiar with it. So basically, we, we want to go into facilities, look to see where your energy inefficiencies are, um, give you a list of recommended projects to pursue. We implement those projects, and then um, we measure and verify the, those results to make sure you have as much of an energy efficient town as possible with your buildings. So our approach, we consider ourselves engineers with hard hats. Actually, out of the 15 people in our division, only three of us, myself included, are not engineers. So we have a very technical um, mindset with our, our group. And so it's great, because when we go in and work with these towns and look at the different buildings and facilities and so forth, they really know what they're looking for. They, they, they've been in the business for decades now, and they can find those inefficiencies. Know, they know about the equipment and um, things that we can implement to really make an efficiently run town. Um, we're very streamlined and collaborative with our process, so um, we get the town involved as much or as little as they want to be involved. And so essentially when we run these projects, we act as a general contractor. So we do the engineering, we do the design, we do the, the bidding of the work to different subcontractors, depending on what type of scope of work you want to have done. Um, we manage the construction, so yeah, we, we do everything as a, as far as it's basically we're a general contractor. Um, and then also important with our approach is that we help to develop the financial solutions for you guys. We understand financing is a big part and budget is always really tight, so we always want to come up with great ideas to help um, get these projects up and going. And one of the things we do, we have a very successful grade with game grants and rebate incentives to, to do that. Okay, so some examples of projects we've done with other towns before include HVAC control with retrofits. We work the building envelope, windows, walls, roof. We do a lot of wastewater treatment plant projects, well pump projects. A lot of lighting, and that includes interior, exterior lighting, street lighting, um, park lighting, retrofits, irrigation controls, smart water metering projects are very popular these days, as well as solar array 
related projects. And we've done quite a few of those up in Washington <coughs> State. And actually, I wanted to showcase some of those um, projects we've done. And I, I chose some towns that are very similar to Platteville as far as size and, and area. So this town is called Palouse. It's a really small rural town in eastern Washington. Their population is actually only 500 people, so they're, they're very tiny. But we met with them and they decided they, they wanted to install a solar array for their town. So now the whole town's electricity goes off of this grid. And um, we were able to secure a solar grant for them in the amount of $276,000, as well as a utility rebate incentive. So you can see the project was a little over four hundred thousand dollars, and because we were able to get these grants and rebate incentives, that paid for more than half. And then if you notice too, the energy savings that they get per year now, they're saving their their town eight thousand dollars a year. So it's a it's a great win for Palouse, and they become quite a, a poster child for that area. Um, you know, a t little tiny town of five hundred people, and they they implement the solar array now all these other little towns around the area want to follow suit so it's quite a successful story that's on top of not having an electric bill correct yeah. exactly yep so colville they're also in eastern washington they're actually more similar size to platteville they're about three thousand people they also implemented a solar array it was a larger array so the project itself was a little bit higher but as you can see, the grant was a lot higher that we were able to secure as well as well the utility rebate netted about the same. But this town, they're saving over $13,000 a year because of the solar array. And then this last town, just to showcase a little bit of what we've done, Toppenish. Um, we did an HVAC replacement for four of their town buildings. And then we also did a light, lighting retrofit of about six of their buildings. And so the project was about $480,000, but through grants and rebate incentives, you know, we got them a good chunk of that project taken care of. And now they're saving over $17,000 a year in energy. So these APC projects really pay off. Um, and so, and you know, the whole idea about APC energy performance contract is to try to make it as self-funded as possible. And we look at those utility savings that you get on an annual basis as far as grants and incentives. And they're also guaranteed. And so I'll go into both um, in further detail. So the self-funded aspect, okay, can be illustrated in this graph. So, Let's just say Catville is a town, they're spending $100,000 in utility annually right now. So if we come in and say, if we do these projects, you're gonna save $30,000. So basically what that means, so this is now you're paying $70,000 to your utility company. And then that extra $30,000 goes to either pay off a loan if that's what you choose to do, or it becomes cash flow, it's just extra money in your budget to um, supplement other projects that you want to do or wherever it needs to go to. So that's what the self-funding mechanism, that's kind of what that means. Um, and like I said, you know, to fund these projects, a lot of towns do a loan or they go into their capital reserves. We look for utility rebates and grants. So we're trying to make the best financial solution for you guys. And, we as Apollo, that's what we do. That's part of the collaboration um, thing. We will actually go out to third-party financiers and try to find the lowest interest rates and stuff for you guys. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a full-service job, as they say. So then the guaranteed aspect of an EPC project. So we provide three guarantees. First being construction costs. Second being energy savings. And then the third would be the performance of our equipment and systems. So if we come to you and say to implement these projects, it's going to be $200,000. And if it's $220,000 at the end of the day, we will write you a check for $20,000. Or if it's under budget, that's just your money in your pocket. You don't have to write us a check or anything. 
energy savings, kind of the same concept. If we say you're going to save $10,000 a year, you're only saving $9,000 a year, we'll write you a check for $1,000. And then the performance of the equipment kind of goes hand in hand with the energy savings. So if there is some kind of shortfall in the energy savings, that means the equipment probably isn't functioning the way it should. So it's on us to make sure that those that equipment and systems are up to par. And then what the state of Colorado requires is that um, we come back and measure and verify your equipment and the projects that we do for a total of three years. So every year for three years, we come back, look at the equipment, uh, make sure the energy savings are there, and we submit a report to the state of Colorado. They're almost like a third body or third party oversight for us. Um, we give you the same report so you can see everything that's going on with um, what we've implemented. It's just a nice, nice process in place. So speaking of process, I'll just briefly go over this. So to make it that streamlined process that I was telling you about earlier, we basically have five different steps. And so the first right now is we're in the qualifying stage. We're just kind of trying to gauge your interest to plateau if this is a, pro um, if a type of project thing you want to go through. Um, from there, we will go into a preliminary analysis. That's our second step. That's where our engineers go to the town, look at all your different buildings, you look at your equipment, kind of figure out your pain points, what's working, what's not. Um, they go back, they calculate all their numbers, and then we come back to you with a list of projects. It's just a laundry list of different things that we recommend, what kind of savings we're looking at. Um, and then from there, if you guys are interested, you, you can pick all the projects, just a handful, whatever you want to do. Um, then we would go to the project development into construction into the measure and verification stage. So um, so the steps one and two, that's no cost to you. So if we come back to the town and do preliminary um, audit with you guys, it's it's free, it's no cost. So so I guess, you know, the next steps would be to see if you guys would like to move forward with this preliminary analysis. Um, and you know, I, I would hope by the end of this, this session we can kind of determine if that's something you want to do or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess if you have any questions about what we do or what's all involved, I'll be more than happy to answer them at this point. How long does it take you to go through the analysis? To do a site walkthrough, to plan the buildings. When we talked to Troy and David, it didn't sound like a whole lot, half a day at the most. And then we would come back. It would probably take at least a couple weeks for us to, we would look at your utility data, and we have to get release forms and things like that. So at least two to three weeks to do our analysis. Okay. And then we would come back to the town board and present it. Can so we talk to the, when we, when we met, we just primarily focused on town hall and shop, which is a large facility, as well as our sewer unit. And we talked about mm -hmm. how that's going to mechanize in the next right. four years. Offset the electrical costs out there because that sewer lagoon, that lift station, the primary lift station alone is half of our monthly electric bill. Mm -hmm. So, we have a and that's what, and that's a great point. Yes. You know, some towns just have we just want this in our mind, but we'll just do it all because you never know what we can bundle, and there might be certain rebates and grants out there, so it ends up being more constructive just to do it all or. But yeah, we, we can definitely analyze it all, and if you decide just to focus on one or two things, that's totally fine. And that's a good point, because our, our two wells at Rearview and Lincoln Park, as well as the ball fields, the ball fields we've been used up a long time, but since we transitioned from CBT to well water a number of years ago, that electric bill has quadrupled. Mm -hmm. Just because it, it just the, uh, the peak charge from Excel oh, okay. to get the, the pumps going. Yeah. But it would be a town wide, my recommendation would be a town wide for the board facility. So, we put this on the agenda for two weeks? Yeah. I think, yeah, because this is not an action item tonight. Sure. But uh, it sounds to me like the board is willing to consider Perfect. on October 16th for okay. formal action to pursue. Okay. 
Yeah. Does that work? Absolutely. Okay. I just hope the Rockies aren't playing that night. <laughs> 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 I got my Rockies purple and I got my Rockies. I took off early last night to go watch the Rockies. Oh, Rockies. Currently, they're one of nothing, Tom and Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad, though, when your wife's from Chicago. Oh. I'm tortured. Well, Tara, that looks good. Is there any questions for Tara? Is she still here? Any other questions? That price, is that relatively comparative to what Platteville will be looking at? I would think so. It's hard to compare apples to apples because that's Washington. Mm -hmm. But. I mean, a solar array is a solar array, so I doubt there's much difference in Colorado. <coughs> I think where you can see some differences is in the amount of grant money, rebate money, that sort of thing, but I think the overall cost of the equipment and the systems would be about the same. Yeah. But we'll know all that with your numbers. Exactly. That's, that's what we would give you better details and better numbers on. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Thank you so oh, much. Sure. Thanks for having me. How successful are those grants? Pretty Achieve successful. Them. So like um, in Washington, I think, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but we applied for 15 and we got all 15. That was last year. Okay. So we have a pretty successful rate and, you know, we, and that's another thing too. We submit for the grants, so you don't have to worry about all the paperwork and that's something that we do. So. Thank you. Yeah, the grants can be kind of tricky. Yeah. So. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to take right. part away from Troy and I'll be enjoying it. I can skip that one for sure. <laughs> All right, moving on. We have a Lego Proclamation, or Lego Week Proclamation. Whereas in 1932, Old Kirk Christensen, a struggling Danish carpenter, just desperate to earn a living, started a company, Lego. Lego Christensen made ironing boards, ladders, and wooden toys like yo-yos, trucks, or ducks with wheels in the 1930s. Christensen's sons, Godfred Kirk Christensen, began building toys in the family factory. And by the late 1940s, 1940s, Christensen bought Denmark's first injection molding machine, and the Lego factory began production of automatic binding bricks. Uh, despite the fact the company suffered three catastrophic fires during the history, Lego remains a giant in the toy industry, sparking the imagination of builders for all ages all over the world. And Lego estimates that during the company's lifetime, it has produced more than 400 billion Lego building blocks and more than 306 million tiny rubber tires for Lego vehicles. And the digital sense of accomplishment of creating your own vehicle, building aircraft, boat, spaceship, animal, robot, or movie scenes from these durable little I don't know, plastic <laughs> blocks has captivated Platteville residents both young and old. Now, therefore, I, Adrian Sandoval, mayor of the town of Platteville, do hereby proclaim the week of October 1st through, two, through the 6th, 2018, to be Lego week in the town of Platteville. I encourage Platteville residents to think beyond the boundaries of brick walls, even plastic ones, and instead look to the creativity, problem solving, and mathematical skills practiced while building with Legos and necessary while building our future. Right. And then next we have Curtis Mork. Anybody else want to come speak before the board? Uh, and just so you guys know, adding to the Lego thing, um, I spoke to Lego directly about the size of my collection because I was told, to their knowledge, I have the largest collection of Lego now in the state of Colorado. But they said that if somebody else wanted to come forward and challenge that, then by all means. But as far as I know, because I actually have my collection registered through Lego, and <laughs> yeah, you should come to my house sometime. <coughs> um, I wanted to give you guys a quick update um, by the way, thank you for all the, the wishes and condolences on my father. As most of you know, we lost him on September 20th after a long battle to Parkinson's. Uh, shortly after his passing, we set up a memorial fund uh, asking all donations to go to the senior center to help with their new bus. The response we've had has been overwhelming, to say the least. Um, as of today, in just one week, We've now raised $775, 12 
towards the senior bus. So now dad owns 5% of the bus. <laughs> he has the back tires or something. But I just wanted to give you that update. My goal is to hit 1,000, so I'm hoping we see that number soon. Um, he was a huge supporter of the senior center. Um, he always went on all the bus trips, and then when his health started going downhill at the beginning of the year, he wasn't able to go anymore. So having this new bus is something he had wanted for a long time. Getting in and out of that van was becoming a challenge for him. So anything I can do to help to make the bus a reality, then please come talk to me. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Curtis. Curtis. Anybody else? All right. So we'll move on to the consent agenda, which includes the meeting minutes for September 25th, 2018. Make your meeting. I make the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? All right. Opposed? All right. Consent <coughs> passed. Moving on to action items. Um, action item A, purchase and sale agreement for 410 Goodrich Avenue. Uh, continue from the September 18, 2018 regular meeting of uh, Board of the Trustees. Mr. Rankin? Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, this was continued. Uh, I spoken to Mr. DeVries. He is present tonight with his wife, and we spoke last week about tonight's meeting. And he, he had asked to be, uh, have the, the ability to approach the board and talk to him. So at this time, Mr. DeVries, talk about. Uh, how we can complete this agreement? Yeah, I, I've already I've been desperately working on it now. Like I, I wasn't even notified that I won the bid for I I mean, but it was our, our fault. We forgot to put the phone number on your sheet. <laughs> so um, I've been, there are some questions. I've already got some paperwork from the, the title company, and there's I have a list of questions that I mean that we just need to get ironed out and because of the non compliant issue, I talked to four different lending associations and it seems like it's gonna be hard to get funding. I mean because of the 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 non compliant issues. And so I just being perfectly honest, I I still am willing to pay, you know, what I did. And I'm working on it. I have two other things in process right now. It's just been, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, in this title search and that, it, it, it shows that the taxes and stuff were paid uh, from 2016, but and there's no nothing from 2017 or 18. Well, Mr. Kip, I may interject uh, mm -hmm. because the town owned the property. Right. The taxes are handled separately. Okay. And these are specific questions that I'd love to work out with you directly offline. Okay. Really involved okay. In the I mean, I, I just want you guys to know that oh, I, I have been working on it, but there's, yeah, so you and I can get together. I think tonight, uh, my recommendation, so we can work out some details with the town attorney and with the title company, is that we continue this to the October 16th. Would that be okay with you? Sure. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, me. sir. I appreciate it. And, uh, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Okay. okay. Sounds good. All right. All right. We'll continue this to the October 16th meeting. Any other Action item B, resolution 2018-15, a resolution opposing Proposition 112. Mr. Rankin? Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Uh, a number of communities in Will County and, and, and surrounding jurisdictions are proposing or Proposition 112 because of the setback requirements for the oil and gas industry. Um, this draft came, I believe, from Fort Lucan, who recently adopted the same uh, similar resolution. Uh, you see it all over the news and the potential impacts. As far as travel is concerned, we, we have a very heavy base of industry, business, sales tax, property tax that comes from oil and gas related uh, exploration and, and, and drilling. Not to mention we have literally hundreds and hundreds of employees in this town today that come here from uh, the Anadarko Ready Service, Advanced Oil Field Service, I can name on and on, but doesn't know that would be impacted potentially. Uh, you hear all kinds of stuff on the news, we understand that. But, uh, 
this is brought forward for the board. Uh, you and I talked about it. And it's being presented to the board for consideration tonight just to show where the town of Pebble stands on this proposition 112. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. I make a motion to approve resolution 2018-15, a resolution opposing proposition 112, as presented. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion carried. And action item C, presentation of draft budget for fiscal year, year 2019. Ms. Rankin. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Uh, we've met a couple of times so far. We have two meetings scheduled for next Tuesday and Wednesday. Not meetings, but state sessions. Both start at 6 30. Uh, we'll see what the menu is later. Uh, the draft agreement is, is very basic. It's based upon the worksheet provided back to me from the department staff. I did input and I, both, and I highlighted in, in, in green, four screen, if you will, some of the conversations we had in the capital process throughout the budget, not many, but some. And I do that just so you can see where the numbers lie or if we're, they end up in different funds. We will revisit the capital projects in two weeks. Next Tuesday, we focus on the general fund from beginning and end, just like you see in our financials and in the budget. Uh, in years past, we said split up by department pay for uh, probably for their benefit, but not this year, we want to start from the beginning of the end. And then next Wednesday, we'll focus on the enterprise funds, not the enterprise funds, the special revenue funds. And we have, you know, we're done with those. And then the following Wednesday, uh, we'll focus on the two enterprise funds and the capital funding fund. What I'm asking the board tonight is, uh, if you have any questions on the general draft, again, this is a yet to be worked on document. These are just initial numbers, the estimates. I've already made some I've already have a, a number of proposed changes for you. Just I keep looking at it every day and I see new things. For example, I left off last Wednesday, not deliberately, but the cost estimate to implement a new cyber on the north side of town. So I need to add that to that file. And we'll discuss that too weeks when we talk about capital projects. As far as this budget, unless you have any other concerns, it's being presented to meet the October 15th statutory deadline. And the uh, last question I have is do you have a date in mind or we can talk next Tuesday about when you want to reapproach the, the employee benefits and salaries conversation. I'm not sure when to add that to the agenda. We have to do so at any time. As far as the study session is concerned. Is there one excuse me. Is there one of those study sessions that's uh, lighter than the other <laughs> in terms of its uh, content? Likely uh, a week from tomorrow, because I lost that Wednesday. We're talking about water sewer funds, and then just the capital improvement fund, which is uh, has a handful of items. Oh, we put it in then? That would be my suggestion. I will add it to that agenda. And that will be, you have, you receive, I've also sent out the capital improvement plan, also the capital priority uh, project list, and the agenda. So if you need additional information, please let me know. And I'll get that to you on the, by the end of the week. Okay. I'm just sharing with him. I know right now. It's not working. No, it's oh, not working. Can I update okay, internet? Mm -hmm. so, okay. All right. We would marry you. With Mary you. The world's going to end my computer failure. <laughs> right? <laughs> my prediction. <laughs> my phone's already possessed. Um, you copy no, it's <laughs> okay. okay, so on the 17th, I'll have a wage and benefit discussion. The 17th? Yeah, so next Tuesday will be the 9th and 10th, and then the following Wednesday will be the 17th. Oh, okay. And our regular meeting on the 16th. I'll update that and send that out to you tomorrow. I can't get back to my slide. Let me make a motion. Let me make a motion to, to continue this. Uh, 
to accept. No, to accept the draft. I was going to say, yeah. Accept motion to accept the draft budget. Why well, make a motion to accept the draft budget? Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, we can do this budget. Do we need to roll call? Yes. Chuck, certainly. Harold Leggett? Yes. Nick Ralston? Yes. Spencer Bradman? Aye. Troy Blum? Larry Clark? Aye. Hope Morris? Yes. All right. Draft budget moving on. Uh, we have action item D, memorandum of understanding, school safety, <coughs> action, well County, Mr. Rankin. Thank you, members of the board. If you recall, Chief Dwyer brought up the initial MOU between the town and the school. They, they obtained the grant funding to implement an emergency channel. This is not with dispatch because they have to uh, maintain that channel. Currently, they're, they're not going to charge for the, the channel during this next year. And I think they really want to see what, what use it has. But uh, it's pretty straightforward. I went over with Chief Dwyer with Carl. And, and I really don't have any concerns with the MOU. It's pretty much a gentleman's handshake at the end. The school is very excited to have yes. this implemented. Hopefully it's never used, but it's nice to have. Any questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Any motion? Make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between Well County and Town of Flatville Schools. Safe connection as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, Terry. Uh, action item E, agreement for services, publication and maintenance of a Platteville Municipal Code, Municipal Code Corporation, DBA and any code. Uh, Mr. Lincoln? Thank you. Actually, this in the, in the final item would be for to Mary. Uh, she's been working on uh, hopefully there'll be some improvements and processes in the front office and also some cost savings. So Mary, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, we've contracted with Muni Code to host our municipal code online, plus to do all of the updates, as long as I've been here. Um, previously it was Colorado Code out of Fort Collins, um, and they merged. Um, this option was developed by an attorney to allow communities quicker turnaround um, with the code, you go into the code and actually update it live and it's always, not always, but within days rather than within a month or so, um, it can be updated. We use the online version almost exclusively because you get a book in town hall and three days later it's out of date um, and the books are incredibly expensive we um, requested supplements recently the cost of that um, they update the pages as you go along and keep the online code up to date but then when they print um, they reformat the pages and send you pieces to fill in the book to bring it up to date. And the cost of that was just over $6,700. As you can see, this proposal is significantly less. It will include some additional staff time to do. Um, but based on the supposition that in general, we do about 30 or less ordinances, usually, in a year, that should not be anything that would create a level of work where we would need to add staff. Just um, complete the training and learn how to do that in house. Any other questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> Move to approve the ag agreement of services of publication and maintenance of uh, Platteville Municipal Code with Municipal Code course for uh, cooperation, uh, multi code as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. 
Nick Ralston. Aye. Spencer Bradman. Aye. Troy Blum. Larry Clark. Aye. Pope Morris. Yes. Harold Leggett. Yes. All right. And action item F, assist financial software package discussion. Ms. Lorenkin, you <laughs> Oh, this is this has been a difficult decision for us to bring to the board. Um, we have used again Cassell as a financial processing package <coughs> for a number of years. Um, that's the way the main office processes payroll, payables, the budget is all prepared, general ledger, utilities. It's the whole deal. Um, it's a very complicated system to use, however. Um, the problem that we have run across is after several personnel changes, it's like any other computer program. Everybody develops their own way to use it, um, and that's not necessarily right or wrong because every computer system can process information in a number of combinations of ways. <coughs> As we've gotten new personnel, however, trying to backtrack and figure out how things were loaded into that system and follow that same procedure has proved to be very difficult. We contacted Cassell and asked them what it would take uh, to have them help us with that. They said based on the size of the system and the number of processes that we run, they would recommend that it would take three specialists on site for at least three days to be able to restore the system to basically the default status so that we could move forward without errors. Um, those people are headquartered in Utah. So it would be airfare, car rental, accommodations, food, and way more money than we're willing to spend to do that. Um, to be able to do it one-on-one -on -one over the phone is troublesome because every time you call to get a technician it's someone else and they have the same things to contend with that we do someone else may have told us to make a change that a new technician would not recommend because they do it a different way that combination of criteria so to speak, led us to start looking to see what else is out there. Um, and we stumbled across this assist software. It's um, a company that, like all companies, there's a hierarchy. Um, most of the other parent companies associated with this system deal directly in databases huge databases, um, different kinds of manufacturing, logistics. Um, they have over 2,000 municipal finance customers across the United States and Canada. So that's a big part of what they do. It's all modeled after Windows and Microsoft um, kinds of applications. So it looks familiar, it acts the same way as if we were to um, load information into a spreadsheet. In fact, many of the applications you can prepare your data in a spreadsheet, um, payroll for example, get all of your numbers in and upload it directly into the system rather than record by record by record inputting data every time. Um, we spoke to ALT, which is the closest community 
um, to Platteville that uses this system. They've been on it for 20 plus years and raved about how easy it was to use. The uh, lady there that does utilities told us that in the six years she's been working with the system, she's had to call tech support three times. There are times here that we call tech support three times in a day and don't necessarily have an answer to what our problem is. <coughs> Another thing that makes it very attractive is the cost. Um, the implement implementation costs are high, as they are with any changeover, um, but the monthly maintenance is about a quarter of what we're paying for Cassell. So if in fact the cost is that much less and it's that much easier to use, it seemed like the appropriate thing to do to ask. The hiccup is we can't just shut off one system one day and start the other the next. There's going to have to be a period where we, in fact, pay for both, update all the data, run dual systems until we're confident that every penny is reported the same in both systems. And that'll take they tell me the, the total data conversion time can be done in three months. Uh, I'm thinking maybe four, because I'd like to have a little, a little padding in case there is an error somewhere in the system that we have to dig to find. Uh, because we won't know if it's on which side necessarily. Um, data conversions are not pleasant. I won't lie to you there. We could have we could have some people who are upset if they get utility bills that are wrong. Um, we are concerned about timing based upon the annual financial audit. Once we shut down a system, it's gone. We can print all the hard copy reports and save all the digital versions of final data that we want, but there's no way we can access that again to go in and pull out a particular document or to look at <coughs> calculation. And we certainly don't want to jeopardize having a, a good <coughs> audit because that's very important to the financial health of the town. So timing, it's, this isn't something that we want to start tomorrow, but we'd like to ask if that seems prudent to move in that direction and if you would consider that kind of a, of a cost. Um, the Cassell programming is about $16,000 annually. If you pay for that um, in one lump sum, there's an 800 and some dollar reduction. We would have to go month by month at about $1,500 a month, in addition to the all the onboarding costs for assist, which is 25, I believe. 23, 6, 23. So, it's, it's more money at the onset. Um, we can certainly continue with Cassell if you prefer. And that 23 would be the first year of service as well? Or is that yes, that's all, all the software, all the data conversion, training, setup, until we go live. So can, is it safe to assume since you did bring it before the board, this is the direction that you and your staff would like to move forward in? Um, the staff has looked at the software. We've all done webinars. We've talked to as many people as we can find that use it. Um, they all say the same thing. The system is, is easy to understand, easy to use. 
Um, but the, the initial process is a process. Um, one of the things that makes it attractive to the staff is that that cost um, for onboarding a new system includes a lot of things that we don't currently have. So it's actually an upgrade as far as um, being user friendly and as far as offering more services to the staff. Um, not necessarily to the town, but they um, they include a, probably a better cemetery system than we have currently um, to make it easier for people to find their information. It includes a work order program um, for public works so that we can track all of that stuff. Currently that's all done by hand. Um, it just, it, it's just more modern and flexible. You said that the after the bulbous uh, first year implementation <coughs> costs, the annual cost is a quarter of what we paid with this So it would be about $4,000 a year. A little less. Costs always change. I imagine that will go up, but I imagine this cell will go up as well. Well, it would pay for itself. In, the initial investment, I mean, it would take two years to, to recoup. Yeah. As we go on next Tuesday, right right now the, the estimate for the sale for 2019 is around 18000 for the rebate to be over 17000 probably annually for the sale next year. I would look at the conversation for next Tuesday, but round up and budget implementation plus at least four months around 30000 but then after that, starting in 2020, you know, our, our annual fees for assist would be around six, seven, or eight thousand dollars instead of eighteen, nineteen, or twenty thousand okay. dollars. So it, there's a one-time investment that's going to take at least two years to recoup. So with this mm -hmm. you don't have to sign a year. You can pay month to month, to my understanding. You get the rebate if you, you pay. You can pay month to month. There are, there are specific timelines associated with discontinuing their service. Right. And that's, yes. And just because they let you pay month to month doesn't mean it's not a year contract, 12 month contract. This is not. This is how we can. Um, as long as we follow the proper channels of, of notification, uh, they <coughs> have to release us. It's not, yeah, it's not, the contract doesn't read that it's um, through December 31st of each calendar year. But we certainly haven't said anything to Casella at this point to make them think that we're even looking. So month to month is still a payment option though? As far as I can determine from the contract, there's nothing. And you have the contract with Casella, do you know when we start with Casella? Oh, it was when Marilyn was here. I don't recall the date. We've had Cassell since I've been here 15 years, so it's been longer than that. But overall, it's a way to improve the front office efficiency, but also improve the budget over time. Yeah. And uh, as Marie said, and she's not the first one I've heard this from in the front office, is just Cassell is set up, and part of it is I think is changing the way training and implementation of this new program will be. I think we need to take out less of the, or more of the personalization by employees and they just need to operate the system based upon a standard that we need yeah. to set. Because cell has been tweaked so many times. Going back to Maryland and Young, back 15 years ago, I mean, I even heard me that comment. Mm -hmm. So we kind of need to walk down the ship when we go to this new system. But well, I think the new system is going to have it pretty well locked down. Yeah. I hope so. Well, I'm the only one in the front office that's never been on this cell, so my, my <laughs> comments are very limited. It's kind of like our easy thing. Yeah. But I understand. Yeah. And are you using the way you work? Yourself? No. Yeah. I hope you understand. Yeah. Yeah, it is difficult. It is tough. Yeah. Is this something that we should consider not going under contract for a year with them in 2019 then? I think the way the show is, is talk to 
um, assist. And basically we'll have to do a contract to begin, correct me if I'm wrong, for mm -hmm. January or whenever we decide. Yeah, whenever. We'd have to be under contract with them and set down a timeline um, because they work with us hand in hand, module by module, and there's a specific order that you have to follow through because, you know, utilities and cash processing won't work unless general ledger's up first. I just want to make sure we budget enough money. So we're paying rent for month, but it's a 12-month contract, or so on and so forth. I think the folks tonight is twofold. It's, it may explain it to you and justify what we're trying to do as far as the front office staff, both efficiency and budgetary. And then budget next Tuesday, the funds to do a transition. I strongly recommend after the March audit's complete. I don't want to mess that up. Knock on wood, we've had good audits for a long time. And uh, then we do that transition in the summer, which is not ideal. It's been time with more utilities, but it's the easiest to roll, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and as far as express bill pay, I see you have some uh, documents in there. Assist would work with them with the current. No, those are add-ons to Cassell that we pay extra extra fees for, and then. And assist all of those modules coming one. So we have to transition everybody to a different way to pay their utility bill and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they have an online version on Excel, they do. So it would just be paste the link yeah. on the website. Yeah. yeah. But all of the uh, <laughs> all of the existing account information would have to be re-entered. We'd have to do a little education for the community. <coughs> Because so, we don't we don't store those like credit card numbers. We have the last three digits, but there's no way we could set that up okay. for them in advance. With assist, do they have uh, an option that we can talk with one person directly specifically for assigned let's say plat bill? So you want to get two different technicians' opinion on how to do something? It's not one person during the setup. There's a team of I believe they said three that are always the same ones that will work with you um, and they each specialize in different modules. So since we have four people in the front office, each person can be working on a different series of modules at the same time. Because a lot of the, the upfront work is very much the same, but still has to be done independently of the other modules. I was meaning more later on once it gets up and rolling if you have issues, tech support. Well, our hope is that we won't be on the phone with tech support all the time. I don't know if uh, that's not something that I've asked. I just say so you get the yeah. same answer for you know, rather yeah. than different opinions from different techs, I don't know if that'd be a So you just want our blessing to move forward with it, more or less? Or do information? If you think this is the way that you would like to see the town go. Well, it's unto you guys. You're the ones from work. Yeah, it's a huge savings for the town. It's going to make your life easier. Right. Right. Well, I think what she's bringing. There is that win-win yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. if we can uh, have the cover sheet, we're not. No action needed. It's just a no action. No action. So mm -hmm. let's uh, take no action tonight. We'll, we'll implement budget discussions next Tuesday because we'll be talking about admin. And then I'll talk to Mary about timing, and then we'll present or bring forward the contract to uh, go with the SIT sometime in 2019. We'll also look at the contract with the if we have to give them the formal notice as well. I will go that way. Okay. Does that work, Mary? Okay. Not for the crowd. They fell asleep during that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on, we are going to go to the Boy Scouts request to use town operated property for Troop 54 events. Mr. Rankin. Thank you. There's been a request made for the board tonight. We have in front of us, is it Troop 54? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, they've got school tomorrow, so let's roll. <laughs> yes. Yes, I know. Uh, okay, you're all I've been trying to put myself on the sleep. Okay. Gentlemen, <laughs> so, the floor is yours. Uh, I'd like to thank you for letting us present the case of using the 
uh, the land that's uh, south of Highway 66 and west of Main Street. Um, so, my, um, I'm Caden Calper. Uh, my position in this uh, in our troop is uh, SPL. I am uh, first class. Um, what I've done, what I've done personally, is uh, with uh, as a scout. Is I've I've helped um, do the flags for uh, our veterans at the uh, um, memorial. Um, uh, yeah, the memorial Day, uh, and then uh, as a troop, we've helped do um, the uh, color guard um, at the memorial. And uh, what we'd like to do, or would like to work on, is uh, what we could help the middle school with the carnival uh, this following weekend. Hello, I'm Tanner Stevenson, <clears throat> and I am second class, and in the troop I am historian. Uh, what I've done personally as a scout is I've, I've made um, an undoing knot tool in smithing and have created a fort out of nature. Um, what we've done as a, a troop is we've gone to scout camp in many camps. Um, what, what I personally want to do is I want to work on getting my next clap, my next ring, uh, and this, this, can this land will help us, help me get that. Um, hi, I'm, uh, Brandon Hansen, and, uh, I'm, a, I'm also a second class, and my, uh, job in the troop is, Quartermaster, and something I've done personally is I have also created a, a shelter out of nature. Um, and something we've done as a troop is uh, I don't remember. Okay, oh, yeah. uh, was we've cleaned up the uh, highway uh, for the past couple of years. And something I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully doing is uh, cleaning up the camp campsite, or the land that we're going to be using for things and other things. Uh, hello, my name is Morgan Quintana. Uh, I'm a tenderfoot. I don't really have a job in the troops. I'm just kind of a handy helper. So, um, something I've done personally is I helped uh, plan the Memorial Day uh, stuff with the Memorial Day committee. For my help, I mean, I relayed information to these guys. Um, something that we've all done uh, as a troop together for the town was we made this bridge for the preschoolers as kind of a rite of passage between going to kindergarten. And uh, something I think we should work on as a troop is uh, actually what you would like us to do with the land if you would give it to us. I'm Jason Hansen. Um, I'm a life scout. My role in the trip is ASBL. Um, something personal I've done is I've I'm like 32 merit badges, something like that. You know, <laughs> no, no, like 21. I don't know. Yeah, I'm less than that, good, but. Um, I want to make myself maybe. look better. I like the first number better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, something I, I look forward to doing is uh, finishing up my Eagle Scout project. What's your plan for the Eagle Scout project? Yeah. Quit. Explain um, some of I plan on, uh, with your permission, fixing up the dock park. Maybe putting some stuff in there. Where's your uniform? So uh, with the land, what we'd like to do is use it for uh, camping and other uh, uh, scouting activities and uh, um, we'd also like to help clean it up or do anything that you'd like you guys would like us to do with that land. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So to add to what they're requesting, the, the town owns approximately 26 give or minus acres of outlaw. On Flat River Farms, the subdivision South 66 between the river and South Main Street. The, the outlaw doesn't exactly touch the river, but it's very close proximity. 
uh, pretty much it's all in the floodplain. That's why it was given to the town. Uh, I will update the board here in a few minutes from my report about Platte River Farms itself and, and that issue. But I, I'd, I'd really like to, I like the idea from the Boy Scouts. I think it's something in close proximity that they could, uh, they could utilize for various outdoor activities, which uh, I think is a great asset. Um, there's some oil gas and, and some private property ownership along that along that river that I'll have to work out with and address so we have to stay away from certain locations. But I think it's a good idea, uh, partnership between the town and the Boy Scouts. Yeah, right. okay. And we'll develop uh, some kind of access point down there for them so they know how to get down and kind of identify where they want to be or what care they use. And what kind of potential are you going to have for other people asking for things. I think that what we should do in the, in the future, I'll work with Kinder that we, we may be looking at, I don't know how far we need to be, but some kind of non-profit civic use of public land. You can certainly look at policy. Just a policy that if the Girl Scouts or if another non-profit group want to come in, especially youth-based, that want to do it to obtain badges and and increase your skills. I think we're all, I think we're all for that. But good question. We need to. Yeah. But there isn't actually river access on this. There's one section that is very close to basically the what I call the marsh area, because I've driven that multiple times, and it's just immediately south of the bridge. But I, uh, the property owner that owns the river uh, is very protective of his property. I think it's posted. We'll have to make sure that we know what our boundaries are. I just want to make sure there's no issue. Absolutely. And I'm sure in the dark, because they have the facilities down there, they won't, we'll just stay away from the facilities, we'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Curtis, do you have something to well, add? Well, I just wanted to add a, a quick comment. Can you come up to the podium? Yeah. Um, as a resident who lives over on, on Goodrich Court, um, we live on the south side of the street, so we overlook that field. Um, I know the troop would be very respectful of this, but um, I will tell you guys that area where you're talking about, there's a family of coyotes that live over there. Every spring we can hear the puppies yipping. We can literally lay in bed at night and hear them yipping. So just a, a word of caution, there is wildlife over there. Be respectful of it. Don't get in their way. So we have to respect our, our animals around here. Thank you, Curtis. Any other questions, comments, concerns, or work? No. I make a motion to approve the use of the town owned property for events facilitated by Troop 54 following guidelines similar to those in the Community Center Use Agreement. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Just have fun with that over there. Oh, we thank, you. Thank, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Moving forward with reports. Yeah, um, Mrs. Kalu. Did you all get my written report? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I just, I'm happy to answer any questions about that um, or expand on any of that. I just want to make sure. Mary and, Mary and I were each waiting for each other. When I was sitting in the report, I was waiting for the packet, and she was waiting to send the packet until she got my report. So. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I guess I just have a quick legal question as far as sure. what are the implications for the town as far as Proposition 74 is concerned? I believe that's the one that has to do with um, costs, uh, paying people for in infringing on their property values? Yes, so you may have seen, I don't know if you received all of the documentation from CML from the Colorado Municipal League. Um, the predictions are dire. You, know, you may have read, I think it was, was it Oregon that passed this and lost $2 billion in the first couple of years. So um, I believe it would be terrible, I don't know how else to put it, for us and for most local governments. Um, I believe there also would be litigation almost instantaneously if this passed. So I can't imagine this would go into, it certainly wouldn't go into effect immediately. 
I think it would be a long time before it went into effect, even if it did pass, but I think it would be rather catastrophic. Um, because basically, we're prohibiting you from taking any action at all regarding any private property. We're talking any zoning, any special use permit. So if you, somebody comes in and says, I need a conditional review use permit under your code, and you decide, no, I don't think it's a good idea, they could sue you for that and ask for money damages. So um, it's, not a, it's not a good... It's They'd not be a good suing point. the town directly. Yes, exactly. Okay. Even if you had fully justifiable reasons for saying no, you know, okay, we want to put in a nightclub, by a conditional review use right next to a house, and it's going to, you know, have hours till 2 o'clock in the morning, and you said, no, I don't think so, they could sue um, And the damages could be rather, and they could just sort of make up damages. You know, perspective damages. Well, I'm going to lose all this money because you won't let me put in the nightclub next to our house. They could sue you for that. So, um, if you like, there's a form resolution similar to the one you passed against 112 that we could certainly, you know, put in your packet for the next meeting if you'd like to pass that. I know a lot of municipalities and counties and special districts and URAs and all these, there are a lot of them are adopting that resolution. I think CML prepared a form, so I'm happy to that for you if you would like. It's entire, I'm not pushing it. It's entirely up to I think that would be good. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that for your next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Listen, number of items that, I, that I've been working on. Uh, the I want to talk, touch base on a couple of items. The Verizon phone plan. Deb and I work on that together with Verizon. What we're trying to do with this phone system, like the phone over here in the corner, it's, it's an archaic system. It was probably the original town phone when Bill was built over 22 years ago. It's not expandable. We found a company that I hope troubleshoot servicing issues, but otherwise it's not supported. So again, similar to what the conversation was with the Citizens Union Code, we're looking at improving efficiency and reducing budget. We currently have CenturyLink as a public provider for phone services. We pay them on average around $1,200 a month in totality. We're with Verizon on a new internet-based phone system. So we plug into the internet in the town hall, but what's nice is that we can get rid of this phone and get rid of that phone, for example. If, I, if we have a meeting in here where we need a phone to take a plug to the one from my office and take it in here and just plug it in and it works just, just perfectly. You can't do that with the other phones necessarily. Uh, now with them today, we're doing two things. Number one, we're changing our cell phone plan. We have one group plan now that's not really functional. We haven't updated cell phones for a while. So we're, we're doing that. We're going to have a public works slash admin, which we're doing about admin. So public works plan and then a police plan because they have different rates because they're categorized differently as emergency services. And with this plan, if you go back to some natural disasters like the 2008 tornado, well, I was chief at the time and I was doing search and rescue, my cell phone went to work and the cell towers were, were falling down. Literally, we had no communication. Since that, FEMA has been involved with wireless uh, services and the police department, Devin's already registered through the FEMA website that during natural disasters, law enforcement automatically has very, well, second priority under FEMA over the general public. So during emergency situations, their phones will be will more likely work when all the lines and all the, all the towers are being crowded. So that's another benefit. So going back to what I call the office plan, right now we're going to meet with him next week. Uh, kind of do the scope because the Dems are working on exactly how many lines we have and, and looking at our infrastructure but we can go from 1200 to around 700 bucks a month potentially so uh, that will be probably coming your way sometimes in the later process <coughs> which no, water that, um, I'm sorry sorry I apologize I interrupt you sorry, but you said it plugs into the internet that would be Verizon's internet so it would be no, it's our telos. Telos. Right. And Verizon would be a backup in case something happened to Telos. We've got to work out all the details that we're going to be with them. I'm learning, I don't know a whole lot about phones, I'm learning a lot about phones. Mm -hmm. Another thing, um, I know that AT&T just recently built an emergency network as well, priority emergency network as well. So uh, they would share with Verizon and I have that for and 
I've been hearing lately the 18 team sprint may, may merge. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But uh, T-Mobile. Is it T-Mobile? Okay. The second thing on my report that I want to mention, and I have a, a handful of other items, is that Sprint Cell Tower I mentioned. They are, are, are somewhat pushy. I'll have to admit that. But uh, they contacted me today, and unless I'm not working with them, um, they need to improve service and identify the 66 corridor, South 85 corridor through Platteville. Uh, we met with them last week, a week ago today, and based upon the area that they, they uh, picked out, it's actually Zale. Zale's out of Boulder. They're contract, contracted by Sprint to fill these little, what I call, stud towers, not the big ones, to help them enhance their uh, service. They initially looked at the front parking lot of the First National Bank, and I said no. <laughs> they looked at the front parking lot of the, of the Exxon gas station, I said no. Uh, they wanted to put it right next to the middle, or elementary school 66, I said no. Um, finally, I said, if you're going to put, then they have a location just south of 66 on 85 in the right of way. And I said, go talk to CDOT, it's a great idea. You know, that way it's out of sight of the money. Now they came back. And they said, C dots, uh, not working with them. <laughs> I know. So, I know. <laughs> so now they're looking at two locations <coughs> in Riverview Park. One is next to the skate park, and the other one is over on the opposite corner by the apartments in the skate park side. Wow. Is used to be on the water tower? They do have. These are small, they're called small cell facilities. Small cells. They have to be lower to the ground. Yeah. Um, I'm the, yeah, we're, I'm negotiating with Zio for a couple of my clients, so well, yeah, they're they, all over. They're all over, but they do. They want to be lower. So well, they so for, I want to pass this around. They look like this is what the tower looks like. It's it's 29 feet from ground level to the top, so it's not as tall as a utility pole. They go wood or metal to kind of match your surroundings. But I told them we try our best to underground everything we can. I'm not trying to. It's just the location bothers me. That's why I said I need to talk to the board about this. Because I don't know if we want it in our public park. What kind of money do we We don't have nothing. Oh, we yeah. get well, we can get some. We can get something, we but they're not it's offered. 200. So under state legislation they're allowed to go honestly wherever they want, whenever yeah. they want. So we don't have a lot of power and we can only charge them two hundred bucks per. Oh, uh, so ultimately we have to say yes to something. We have to say yes to something. Is that a month or a year? A year. Oh, that's not too bad. With a 1% escalator. There's no fence around it. It's just no, no. But our ordinance, because we don't want a whole bunch of cell towers throughout five, what we have is called the CMRS. We try to co locate. So I try to tell them they have the pole, but actually they have about eight foot of equipment with the antenna on top mm -hmm. of what they have. I said, we have a tornado site. Is that, oh. Why not co locate? Go locate your equipment on the middle of the pole, and then put your antenna on top of the side of it. I mean, we don't, we've never actually used it in a real event. We test it, we're test it once a month next year, but that shouldn't affect what you're trying to do. What did they say to that? They like the idea because part of their rules and regulations, they can't have a pole within 50 foot of a residential area, and that pole is right next to a private residence. That's that perennial side right there. And by the building, that's the location. So we should probably talk because I think you're probably going to have to redo your regulation. Yeah, because I can tell they're outdated. Yeah, they're outdated. What about the one uh, by Colorado Wire? See, they have to be at 66 corridor. That's the problem. They have to be within a block of 66 corridor. That's the because triangulation of the other tower? So you can talk on the phone and drive at the same time. Wow. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I think you got a heck of a dead part down there. It's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a form agreement that we've been negotiating with SIO and we have some form code changes that we can look at. But in the end, they gotta go somewhere. They gotta go somewhere. They gotta go somewhere. I know they're town owned property. Within right away. They want they want public right away. They want in the right away next to the road is typically what they want. And what like about um, Troy said, in the sixty six is probably where they wanna be. West side of Main Street. They can go on existing tra street lights, traffic poles, things like that, so you can push them to do that. We so talked can, about that, but mm -hmm. they don't want to be on any C dot traffic mm -hmm. line. <laughs> because
can see that obviously not working with them very well. Right. My suggestion is we also have a current utility pole that really just services a single circuit to a light over by the skate park. I can see if that's close enough to them where they can just co-locate their equipment on the utility pole. Sometimes they'll replace the utility pole right. with one they like better mm -hmm. that will still serve the utility purpose, but also mm -hmm. it's their pole. My next question is how do they get along with Excel? Do you know? Um, I don't know about Zyle. I only know about Verizon. Because Verizon's going to come next, by the way. This is Okay. That was first, and then Verizon will be here very shortly. This is an old picture, but basically the skate park's here. There's a flag, and they want to put. This is the pole I'm talking about. It's just, it, this is just a light pole. It has a single string. They want to put it next to it. I'm thinking, why can't they just use the pole we already have? I just don't want more poles going up the lab now, even though it's it, it's been enhanced, you know, strength uh, quality. So. And just put them all in the same area and have like limbs and trees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll, I'll, I'll work with them. Yeah, let me know. We may have to do a code change too. Yeah. So we may need to work on that. The town's not liable for any damages or anything. Yeah. 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 Ye
His wife carries her cross on her. So just quickly, a couple other things. Flat River Farms, it's pretty well dead in the water. I've been talking to Peter about that. They they now have a land use attorney that presented us their title work and they've stripped everything from that land. We can't we can't dig a shovel in the darn thing, honestly. They sold off all mineral rights, all water rights, all mining rights. The fifty acres is useless. Basically. It, you wouldn't be able to do hardly anything with it. Hardly. But as Troy said, it's pasture lands. They've, they've, they've severed all the mineral interests there. So it's lease agreements there. Are. So it's very, very limited what you could do with it. You wouldn't be able to build a home. What would you do with it then? You just be, be open, open space? Or? It could be open space. It could be just pure open space. It could be natural open space. Is that going to do like trails or? We'd have to, basically, we'd have to clear, clear everything with the mineral interest holders. Everything we do, we have to go through mm -hmm. the mineral interest. Uh, it's yeah. not worth it. I mean, honestly, yeah. we're not currently committed to a purchase agreement. No, no, no. no. no we're well, we were at sort of a due diligence stage. So you don't see. get the fine print. So there's no action that needs to be taken. No, I, I mean, unless I mean, if the board wants to say, okay, we're done, we don't want it anymore, that's fine. Then you can stop pursuing it, or the board can say you should continue and see what you can do. There's just everything's. Everything's taken off the property, so the surface is rather useless at this point. So we really don't need to pursue. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. it will remain open space simply optimistic. because no one else can do anything with it. So right. why buy it? Right. Right. So here's fifty thousand dollars for fifty acres of trails, and I also have about ten thousand dollars worth of abatement that needs to be done on the prairie dog. I've already found that out. So I just don't think other than trying to pass through problem on I think it's worth the investment. I will send them notice though to start the abatement because that's their responsibility. Yeah. Yep. Because those yep. the residents are getting more and more upset. Mm -hmm. They've held off on that until we make this decision. So I'll notify them tomorrow. Uh, you want to come back to the table with something so. better. Well, they can't be so yeah. well, they're just selling the air. Well, they may be able to get an agreement with the mineral rights holders. So yeah. well, that's going to be something with it. Sure. Well, I mean, we could, uh -huh. there's certainly an, so, an opportunity to negotiate. I'm just saying it's, I don't think it's quite what we thought we were. Right. Right. No, they would have to, they, they'd have to get them to be well to do that. Right. But uh, we would still talk. I can try it one more time and see if we can. We, I mean, obviously, we don't want any water or any gas right with the right. mineral department. If we could get for some, you know, a fishing lake or a retention pond. Yeah. We'll be able to do we something. talked about <coughs> a park and maybe some homes. You know, you build homes and have a park on it. Mm -hmm. We could figure out a way for us to do that. So, it would be interesting, right? Yeah, we'd have to look at the exact locations of any surface lease agreements. And, you know, I mean, that would be something similar on their part. But if they want to come and say, you know, here are some spots where homes could be built and here are, you know, um, all of those homes would have no would have severed mineral interests too. So that's pretty difficult. Yeah. To say anyway. True. Um, so were all these things that were stripped off the property done since our initial discussion? No. Oh, that was done prior. That was done prior. Okay. Well, he did that back in 05 yeah. when the town brought it in as a, as a subdivision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I, mean, I don't. Yeah. Which I don't understand. So how would they were going? That may be the reason why they didn't divide it or subdivide it not like a lift station, but. They couldn't even break ground there. Not without mineral or some of the biggest being in place. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll talk to him. We'll see where it goes. The uh, last two things real quick uh, before you have any questions is uh, I'm really getting a lot of calls on code enforcement. I've been contracting with Safeco for four hours every Tuesday morning. His name is Chris Pratt. He told me today that uh, he's ready to go out on his own. He's got the insurance. So he's he's going to make a proposal to me next Tuesday. I did advertise position with really relatively no response that was qualified. He's done it for years. He's a former 10-year uh, member sheriff's deputy back in the day. He wanted to get out of that. And uh, he, he enjoys doing code enforcement. Gilcrest, Hudson, Georgetown, and several others are talking to him about contracting. So what I'm asking him to do is at least three days a week. So I have to have follow-up and consistency. He knows that there's a lot to do, but with four hours a week, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So that if I can work out, negotiate a deal with him cost-wise, because hours depends on the rate. Right now, I paid say about sixty bucks an hour contract rate. Wow. Because they have all the they have the software program, they have the printer, the car, the computer, the car, all the insurance. So I'm gonna see what he's willing to negotiate. 
that he could kill it off pretty fast. You know, following the line with that is I'm also getting almost weekly complaints on parking and trailers. Primarily Old Homestead, Stevens Circle, parts of Rogers Farm, River Street's becoming a mess. I'm getting complaints almost daily. The guy that picked the VFW now, they're parking over by his side of the street, he's complaining. What happened is Valley Village changed some regulations where they're limited on vehicles, so they're all parking on river. I had to give tickets to the, the trailers over there that were parked over there because they can't, they're aware of their 72 hours. But um, maybe not tonight, but at the next meeting, I really want to talk to you about what can we do to mend those regulations. Not just parking, but really trailers is a big issue, I'll be honest with you. Um, I get some complaints in read, not so much. Not being in Bella Vista, but most of it is Old Town, Rogers, Stevens, Old Town meaning on the river because of the influx. So what do you want, are you, are you saying to change it to let them keep the trailers there on the street? And I'm not, not necessarily. I'm, I'm familiar, we need to take a hard look at our ordinance and see if it's actually effective. There's a lot of self-employed people in this town. I you know, wish we could get some property that we could you know, lease to people to, to park their trailers at affordable rates. There's places to go. That, I mean, one of the lots in the energy park is going to become a self storage where people will park their stuff. But when you use it to work on a regular basis, it's difficult time wise to go across town, get your equipment, get your trailers, and blah, blah. I get that. But it's surmounting to the point where parking is becoming a huge issue. And I think we need to talk about it on next week or next meeting on the 16th. Because I'm, I'm just passing on, it's, it's, it's getting pretty bad. What does the solution to River Street look like? <laughs> well, I, I, I quarantine off the quarantine, so probably not the best word, but I sectioned off about a 150 foot area around the bus stop and I allow the bus to park over there four days a week, well, five days a week now, because you know, they can't find drivers. So I try to work with the local bus drivers, so they can park during the school day and then during the school, you know, during the weeks and then weekends they take it back to the bus bar. But they're having a horrible time maintaining drivers. So I try to work with the school district on that. Um, I met with Amy Herman, the new principal. We met last week. I know Adrian had a conversation. We were going to the school. Randy Kern did the middle school today. I know he's the maintenance for, for the school district. He has to paint the curb over. Uh, for the drop off on Salisbury at the elementary school. People just aren't listening. They're not abiding to the sign. So we're going to park, we're going to paint it. They're going to paint it. Uh, I've had David or the sign in the post for no parking during school hours along that painted section of the curve next to the new gym. And our SROs are going to go enforce it. We're going to start writing tickets. If they don't listen, they get one warning. We're going to start writing tickets. Because you got little two foot tall little kindergartners walking out in the middle of the street and these cars you can't see. Isn't there a sign there warning? What's that? There's signs the warning? There's those the big signs on the fence and on the on the wall that says temporary parking pick up and drop off, but I've seen people go there as, as early as two o'clock in the afternoon and park there until three thirty before yeah. the kids get out. I'm not trying to be personal here, but it's real ridiculous because it's about you know, safety first. It's a safety first is what we have yeah. to do. So we're going to have that Give me a time for parking. You know, you're not parked here between during school hours. During school hours. Base number going 7 30 to 4 o'clock. Yeah. Half hour before, half hour after school. Just in case, because like my son, he stayed a little late to get some help, actually work on math, so he's there till 4. You know, elementary school office for like that as well. So, uh, but really, those are the, the topics I want to bring up tonight, and uh, I want to discuss some code stuff with you. Hopefully on the 16th for both code enforcement and also, I just, the board needs to have a conversation about what I'm hearing about the trailers. Okay. And it's not just work trailers, it's yeah. pontoon boat over on Buckbury Boulevard. I've got campers that might move two foot and say they, they were gone. So I don't, I don't know a way to regulate it. Yeah. I can't regulate it. So that's why I really need code officers as well, so. I mean, if they can't follow Directions, I guess you just don't have well, I've had a lot of talks with people saying, you know, why can they not respect my property and not park in front of my house? Right. I get a lot of that. 
And I said, well, you know, it's a public street. I can't tell them where to park. We want to be park away from the public street. You know, so, and before we talked about parking with the limitation on, on occupancy for non-family members a couple months ago, my cleaner was here, he said, if you start doing parking, you hire somebody full time to just do this parking regulation in the town. Because otherwise you can't afford it. But it's, it's an issue. And I know living in a small town it has its luxuries because you have your toys and you're not restricted to HOAs. And I fully support that. You know, I'm from a small town myself, but it's get to the point where you need to look at some options on what we can do. Some people force you to do that. Would uh, bring them back that property over there, but there's no service rights. I was just thinking the same thing. Would it be a possibility of renegotiating a price to a lower price, being that you can't really do anything besides put trailer parking um like you suggested maybe a, a, i don't know if the town can charge people for that or i mean like a, how would you how would you write that up you're like public like public trailer parking i, I don't know i mean it's almost like maybe you set it up like a campground where you can pull in your rvs there or something yeah. what difference is it over there or in a place people just don't want to go over there and get any place to get their trailer and bring it to their home to work on they just don't yeah they don't want to do that so it, it's tough to some properties are suited for it to have the additional trailer camp or rv whatever boat and some properties simply aren't mm -hmm. and that's just it's a personal property of choice i get that but uh we're just having an issue i don't want the board to know that it's in this, in this mountain it's getting worse I'm looking forward to your suggestions. <laughs> How do you think about it for two weeks? You know, <laughs> <coughs> otherwise, that's really what I have. I, I mentioned already next Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll meet here at 6 30. Uh, pretty focused driven conversations that I want to have with the board on budget. Um, tomorrow, I'm actually taking a quick drive up to Breckenridge, uh, the senior bus. There's a week conference up there, but I thought I'll. Part of transit authority is part of it, or transit division, I should say, the rail transit. Uh, in the afternoon, for a couple hours, they're having some of these buses on display, and you can look at, inspect them out, and actually order a bus, is what they're telling me. So I'd like to just get that done and over with, so I can move on to the next project. Uh, the seniors do have, I know Chris mentioned, but with the money they have, they're, they're close to $5,000 right now in, in available funding. And we're looking at 15 if we max out the grant because the, the state would take 68. It's a 70 some thousand dollar project. So that's the grant. If I can find something for less, it'll be less than that. So I really don't want to go to the breakfast tomorrow, but I think it's productive. I can just get this done out of the way. And uh, this is not on the Friday. No, no. I don't need to leave till like 9 30 and I'll come back and I'll rush out at 5 o'clock. Yeah. May have to start one along the way. <laughs> but otherwise, I uh, hope any questions you may have. And do you think that that Apollo Services that we talked to earlier would they be a good candidate for like the police station thing we talked about, or the new shop, or are they just the charging stations we talked about? Existing facility. I think they focus on existing facilities, what my understanding is. They had to reduce and become more energy efficient. On what you already have. Because mm -hmm. when David and I met with, with Tara, we, Tara, I think her name is Tara, we mentioned at some point building a new facility next door for the police station or a storm shelter or whatever. And she said, well, what we provide you, you would just carry on in future additions or expansions. We'd implement those tools and those suggestions. So, uh, and actually the company that David and I talked to, the, D, the D2C Architects, they're in the same mindset. Because they design all their buildings to be LEED certified, energy efficient, so same concept. So, anything we do now will, will be energy efficient, like the senior center. It's not LEED certified, but the same, same HVAC, window rating, insulation, everything was implemented on that project. I think it's worth having Apollo at least do the proposal because the cost is right. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. And you, you can see what potentially the town could save long term and be more green. Yeah. 
So have you talked to me? They have a big solar station west of town. It's uh, 34, 34 towards uh, county line. Are they running off that solar station, or what is that? I'm not aware. I know of Maverick. the area, but I'm not sure what it's, it's for. To my knowledge, that that's where I grew up. That's not attached to me, to my okay. knowledge. But I could be wrong. Okay, I was just curious if that may be what... It's like a mile and a half west of me. Yeah. Speaking of folks in open space, that <laughs> solar farm. <laughs> we just need to waste money on land and well, I think if you bring up points that there's potential <laughs> something there, maybe. I am working with another gentleman because we gave him our copies of our bills for the last 12 months on our Excel, and he's looking at the five acres adjacent, somewhat south, east of the sewer mill, Mr. Crystal's lands for sale, has been for years, and paying on a solar array solely to offset the cost of the sewer mill. And he, this month, he applies. He looked at the RP process for Excel to see if we can some kind of formalize an agreement to where we can reduce our cost. Because uh, that's when your real cost is when the mechanical plant goes in line, mm -hmm. much more than it is now. We're paying for a lift station now. Now that we're actually making, treating water with mechanical systems, electricity is going to go up. Rather than reeds. What's that? Treating water with mechanical systems rather than reeds. Yeah, yeah. And we have the family muskrats out there in case you want to know. <laughs> and actually they're causing issues because they're chewing up all of our electrical lines to our aerators. So we have to, we're burying all of our lines to the aerator. Okay. And putting them in conduit and it's very time consuming. Yeah. So. So invite the hot fire. Right? <laughs> well, Mr. Evans said he will not, he's helping us out. He's actually heard of a situation where guys are out in the boat in the lagoon going to an area to fix it. The line is wow. is severed and that water is actually electrified. Mm. Oh, wow. So we don't want that to happen. Yeah. We're taking care of the problem. So I think thinking about that hazard. <laughs> What's that? You jump in first. You <laughs> jump. We need to trap some muskrats. Uh, rubber boots. We need to track some muskrats. <laughs> and hire a trapper. Larry, what can I volunteer for? Trap and some muskrats. One more thing. Seventh Rockies won. No, they didn't win. It's one and the seventh inning. Last night they lost, but they're still in the playoffs. This is the official walk up. They have to win to keep playing. So, anything else for choice? Okay, so I got an invitation for a CDOT town hall meeting um, in Milliken, at the town hall in Milliken, on October 9th from 5.30 to 6.30. Is anybody else joining? Budget is at 6.30. <coughs> yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> and the conversation with Pelos, uh, Troy, David, and I met with Pelos, and they want to see what kind of interest we have in town to bring internet to the and concerns about the price they're going to need to have, but if people won't have problems, it's reliable, and it's 50 over 10, so I don't personally know what that means, but apparently it's fast. It's good so service. it's 50 megabytes download, 2 gb 10 megabyte of course, it's probably Yeah, it's 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 speed yeah. Okay. it's just Fairly fast. It is pretty fast. Town hall we get about 15 to 15 So and then yes, so I'll be sending out a survey on social media platforms just to see what we can come up with. Is it a cost that the town has to put up? No. It's a, it's it's a permission to get them in town. Well, well they have to sign up for the service, really. Well, the key is they need to have so many clients to make it feasible, cost-effective for them. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, yeah. we can get... How much per household? How much? What's that? How much per household? Well, so 50 over 10 mm -hmm. plus employees? No, no, uh, amount-wise. Wait, if I get it, how much am I paying? Hang on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 50 over 10 plus a voice line, so voice over internet phone, $100 a month. 
reliable gun by the home phone. And the readers. The readers will go down. And no, the, go no up so that's the other thing. We talked about not on peak hours. If it goes down and they start getting alerts that service is not working during peak hours, they'll come in and install what they have to to make it so it can handle the customers they have in this town. It's more of a residential service than a commercial area. Yep, right. What it comes down to. Yeah. How bad do you need it? Do you work from home as a living? I was going to say, exactly. Some of us are right. from home heavy to be able to rely on that. Well, and, and it's, so the thing is, is it's not per gigabyte per, you know, it's not a data package. It is unlimited. And you this know? is internet based. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be internet served by town hallways. It's not going to be wired. wired. Right. Like right now, Century makes all the junk. Right. What did they say about their, um, do we have any trouble with, like, was it some thunderstorm or anything like that? Do you have trouble with the service here? Is there any like we used to when we, when we had watt wire or whatever it was called because we were bouncing off those two antennas. Sky beam. Sky beam. But Telus has never had an issue like that. Telus, we get, you come to Denver, it hits Firestone, bounces, or Dakona bounces the Firestone and comes to us. And it's pretty high speed, it's been really consistent. We haven't had an outage yet, to my knowledge. We, we've had some perks with three perks. Some of that's a firewall is right there. Right. He said, yeah, so he said that they you know, could see all that happening, and he doesn't see any problems with us. Cool. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's something, a different option for citizens yeah, right. to consider. Right. Right. Was there a minimum amount of customers they wanted to see? <coughs> they wouldn't give us that number, but I would be, I would probably expect 60%. Right. With us. We, well, if I may, you know, we have about 700 give or take residents, so I think they would need at least probably two to 300 to make it worth it back. Yeah, maybe some options moving forward with laying fiber and working with the town on different things. And I mean, they're all ears, is the is what I got pretty much. Awesome. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Other than that, I don't have anything else. Anybody else have anything? I guess I just have one question. 5013C status, C3 status that we had, the town was trying to work into, is that still ongoing? I, I put on hold for a while. I either need to have Kendra or David Green work on that, and I, I just need to give them the green light to get that done. So I think I'll probably have Kendra do it. Actually, her, her staff to get that rolling for the first few years. That doesn't take very long to and we just have to decide the dollar amount become the level we want to be 501c3 as far as donations. Okay. I know there's different levels on 501c3. Yeah, we, there's, you know, you have to be stated bylaws and articles in corporation and you get your tax number and all that, but that's, it's not difficult to do. So the, from my understanding, the, this board would also be the board on the 501c3? You can set it up like that, exactly. And after every election, we just have to amend. Yep. Yeah. I honestly, I forgot for a couple months, and I think about that recently because talking to David Green's like, there's something I think I need, I need mm -hmm. to do. Anything else? Mr. Manager? Thank you.